Welcome everyone. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the various lands on which this video is filmed. I pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Darawal people on whose land I'm joining you from today and the land on which I was born and have spent most of my life. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching. Sovereignty was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Isabella burton Clark. I've just finished my fourth year of a dual criminology and social work degree at UNSW, and I work in communications and engagement for both the UNSW Division of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute. Thank you for joining us for the second edition of the Speak Out series, part of the Be A Better Human initiative. The Be A Better Human campaign is a collaboration between the Student Union ARC at UNSW and the Division of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, which aims to strengthen a respectful and inclusive culture at our university. Together, we want to encourage everyone to do more when it comes to understanding, preventing and responding to disrespectful behaviours. We call upon the UNSW community to commit to challenging all forms of discrimination, misconduct, bullying and harassment and become allies to diverse communities. The Speak Out series started with a presentation from the amazing Khadija Ba, and it invites people to courageously share their personal experiences of speaking out about injustices. We hope these stories will help the UNSW community to understand how we can better support our classmates, colleagues, friends and fellow community members by being an active bystander and safely providing support to those being impacted. To mark International Day of People with Disability, the Be A Better Human initiative is pleased to collaborate with the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute on this event. The International Day of People with Disability was created in 1992 and aims to increase public awareness, understanding and acceptance of disabled people. This year's theme is leadership and participation of persons with disabilities toward an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID world. Today, I'm honoured to introduce you to Nicole Lee. Nicole is a family violence survivor and passionate advocator. After suffering a decade of abuse at the hands of her former husband, Nicole now uses her lived experience of family violence to speak out for those who don't yet have a voice. Nicole, who also uses a wheelchair, focuses on family violence perpetrated against disabled people and anyone else who depends on carers or family members for support. Nicole has played a major role in shaping how Australia responds to and works to prevent family violence. Among many advocacy roles, she is presently a board member at Safe Steps Family Violence Support Centre and serves on the board of directors for People with Disability Australia. Nicole is also a widely published author and sought after commentator on issues surrounding mental health, intersectional feminism, disability representation, access and inclusion, motherhood, and also topics surrounding body image and acceptance after undergoing a preventive mastectomy. Following Nicole's talk, my colleague, Professor Jackie Leach Scully, the director of the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute, will ask some of the questions you have submitted. But for now, please join me in welcoming Nicole Lee. Thank you for having me here today. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting today across you know, multiple locations um, within this land of, of ours and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and this is the 16 days of activism as well as International Day of People with a Disability. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the victim survivors of domestic and family violence and, and pay my respects to the families of those who've lost individuals, um, be that children or, or women, to domestic and family violence um, and acknowledge that we do this work out of honour of, of every life moving forward and to make sure that nobody is left behind and that nobody is forgotten. Um, and these 16 days of activism um, is part of our world every single day, not just for the 16 days at the end of this year. Um, and I hope that 
moving forward, um, we do get to a point in Australia where we have eliminated violence against women and we're not seeing one woman a week murdered at the hands of a current or former partner. Okay, so as, as it was introduced at the beginning, we're here as part of the um, Be a Better Human campaign, and I, and, I, and I love that title, to be honest with you. I think it's, I think it's brilliant. It encompasses all of our responsibility um, in looking at what does gender-based violence mean, you know, and, and how can we all be part of breaking down these things. And, and, you know, especially now that we're opening back up and we're in this post-COVID world, you know, that this now more than ever is a really important time when we're re-engaging with everybody in our communities again. And what can we do to ensure that this community that we're going to have to rebuild is, is one where, you know, nobody is left behind and we have a safe and inclusive environment for all. Um, so I wanted to kind of... Uh, discuss around, you know, what does abusive behaviour look like with a lens of disability applied for bystanders? Um, and so really quickly about myself is that, so as, as was mentioned in my bio, I'm a survivor of domestic and family violence, and that was perpetrated at the hands of my former husband, who was also my carer. Um, and that has led me to to what I'm doing today and, and this work in, in sort of activism and that awareness raising. So, you know, violence against disabled women and disabled people is often really visible to the external world. So, you know, what does this look like um, for people around us? Um, financial abuse is, is one of the really, really big examples that I'll give you here right now is that um, we look for red flags when it comes to violence around controlling behaviour, somebody, you know, controlling somebody's finances, um, telling them what they can spend and where they can spend it. When you bring in things like disability, unfortunately, people start to think that maybe this is this person's role of caring and all of those red flags just become flags. Sorry, that's my cat Humphrey. Go away. Um, <laughs> you can probably hear him meowing. But all of those red flags start to disappear and we overlook what we would normally be concerned about. So I know for myself, um, an example I can give of this was going into the bank and applying for a home loan where I'd been forced to buy a house against my will and you know, some really horrible financial abuse going on here. But sitting there in front of a bank manager with my ex-husband and, and being pushed and coerced into, you need to have a joint bank account. And I sat there and said, no, I don't want this. I don't want a joint bank account. Um, I had my own internal fears around being controlled, him having access to my money and that taking away all opportunities around safety and, and ways to leave. But having these two men sit there, my partner and the bank manager saying, but why don't you want this? This just seems practical. And when you're not well, and and it was positioned around disability, it was positioned around gendered norms, and I was being pushed and railroaded into something as simple as a joint bank account and nobody actually listening to what this woman in front of them is saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in that right now. Can we move on? It's not happening. You know, good for me is that I did stand my ground. It didn't happen. Um, it was not a really great experience and, and that did lead to other things, but I'm not even going to go into that. But if there was no disability involved in that conversation, would that person have sat there and tried to push me, even though I have stood my ground and said, no, I'm not doing this. If disability was not there, if the role of a carer was not there, would this person have sat there and continued to push me into a position that I'd stated I wasn't interested in? Um, you know, other examples of these things where this, this abuse is really visible. Um, if you see your friend and their um, you invite your friend around for a cup of tea or you see your friend going off to the doctors and everywhere they go, that person is with them. Their partner is with them. They go with them to the supermarket. They go with them to the maternal and child health appointments, to uni, to the doctors, to, you know, the local library, everywhere. If that person's going everywhere with them, you start to question and wonder, hang on, this doesn't seem right. But because I had a disability, nobody questioned that. Everywhere I went, he went. And this is a common theme for people with disabilities is that people just assume that we don't go out alone when, you know, quite obvious, 
I'm quite capable of going out on my own. I'm quite capable of being independent. But the fact that nobody questioned him following me everywhere, nobody questioned him coming into when I had a pap smear, he stayed in the room. Nobody questioned these things. The thing that stopped people questioning, the thing that stopped people um, being that bystander was disability. Um, you know, and it's, it is confusing and, and it is really kind of murky territory um, because it's just like the, the argument of not all men are abusive, not all carers are abusive. A lot of the relationships are loving, caring, respectful, um, healthy relationships but some of them aren't. And that's where we need to start as bystanders actually questioning what we see, talking to the individual with a disability on their own and asking, you know, are you okay? Do you want him coming everywhere with you? You know, making those opportunities to just check in with that individual on their own and not just taking what we're seeing for granted and going, oh, he's just caring. Because the worst thing that happens is you're wrong, the person says, yeah, no, everything's fine, or the person starts to express, oh, actually, this is happening, that's happening, and, and you've given them the opportunity to feel seen. You've given them the opportunity um, to feel validated because we don't know who we can trust. We don't know who we can talk to, and unless you come to us and say, hey, I've, I've seen this and, and I just wanted to check in, you know, we don't know whether or not it's okay to disclose to anybody or um, because so many people are seeing these things happening, this is where this kind of abuse and violence starts to get normalised for us as well because no one else is saying anything. So we start to question our reality, we start to question our world and we start to question what um, we're thinking and believing. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And... It's this murky, murky, murky territory. And the role the bystanders play in this, the role in creating this equal and safe world is opening up the conversations, um, not turning a blind eye and walking past something that makes us uncomfortable just because disability is involved in the picture. Um, and questioning that position of carers. You know, we tend to put carers on that on that pedestal of being these devoted, loving, caring people that will do anything for someone. Unfortunately for me, that was a person that was abusing me that was put on that pedestal. And, and to always be mindful, like I said, you might be wrong, but you could be right. And that could be the difference for somebody, um, you know, like myself or for other people. And finally... <laughs> You know, what is a safe and equal world um, for me? It's it's one where we have fully broken down not just ableism that clouds this judgment for people, but the stigma that society situates disabled women in. You know, for a lot of us and, and myself included, for for older older disabled women, um, I've found my voice later in life. But I have lived a life where I've been viewed as needing care versus being viewed as an independent woman to be empowered um, with my own autonomy and agency. For a lot of us, we've lived a life without those worlds as part of our reality. And how can we as a society, um, you know, bring down and reshape this, this lens of this helpless passive um, passiveness that is placed on us? Um, you know, this is the role that allies can play is part of reshaping that, is part of breaking down those things and reconceptualising what do we mean when we think of women and women with disabilities, um, that we tend to get cotton wooled, we tend to have had everybody else around us in our lives taking control of it or doing things for us versus actually talking to us like equals, um, positioning us as being in the driving seat. And, you know, that reframing of all the people in our external lives and the way that they view us and start looking in on us um, is something we need allies to help us with. Um, you know, I, I can only do and we can only do, disabled people can only do what is, you know, within their remit, within their own little bubble and circle of friends. So I'm talking to a group, group of allies right now. I'm talking to people I'm hoping if, you, if you're coming into this event to listen, you're already pretty on board with this agenda. But 
it's those people outside of our little bubbles here, outside of our feminist, you know, um, worlds that we need to start reaching out to, breaking through to. It's all of those little conversations that you overhear. Um, I think I heard someone recently and I pulled them up on it uh, that was saying around, they were talking about love on the spectrum and aren't autistic people just cute? And I pulled them up on it saying, what on earth do you even mean by that? <laughs> um, and, and I brought in my friend Sam Connor. I dare you to say, Sam Connor, you're cute to her face. She's fierce, independent, disabled, autistic, activist, you know, woman who is frank and fearless and there is anything but cute about her. And getting people to really sort of stop and think around the language they use when they talk about us, all of those things are things that we can do as individuals in society to create that equal, fair and safe world moving forward, especially now that COVID's coming down, um, we're starting to open up. What does that mean? How do we you know, bridge the gap between how life was before and how life is going to be moving forward? And I think, honestly, we're in a really pivotal moment in society and the world right now where, you know, we have a chance to reshape and change the way we interact um, moving forward. And, and, and let's not lose that moment. Um, so, yeah, thank you. So thank you, Nicole, for that really fantastic um, address um, and introduction to your life and to your activism and, and to, to, to this topic. Um, and we have several questions for you. One that came to my mind that I'm going to exercise my privilege by um, asking you this one, this one first was you talked about disability and you've also talked a little bit about um, the, the, the gendered nature really but do you think there are ways in which those those two interact and that um, in some ways we um, we ignore um, the possibility of neglect and abuse and so on of people with disability because at some level we don't people don't think that they are quite, or we are quite like other we're not really human you know um, and perhaps something like that plays into attitudes towards um, women being exposed to ab abuse and violence as well, that they are perhaps you know, less important than or that there's something almost, you know, almost natural about seeing uh, a woman subordinate to a man and so on. It's a very complicated area. It is a very complicated area and it is very much, um, you know, I can't underestimate the role that disability and that um, that, that, that gendered stigma of disabled women, um, you know, plays in all of this. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I guess, some of the things that are, you know, kind of missing from, you know, the, the discussion or, or the things that, that, that intersect with this issue is the fact that um, people can't see themselves in my shoes or our shoes and our lives, you know, that we're not you know, seen as the same as other people, especially when, you know, the able-bodied world is always in the driving seat behind, you know, change and policy and legislation, um, you know, running all the organisations, um, heading up sectors and things, and that, you know, that we're usually brought into discussions but we're not actually usually at the top of those um, hierarchies. So, if people can't, uh, I guess, relate to our experience, it becomes unrealistic or it becomes different. I wouldn't say less than, but it's hard for people to conceptualise our worldview because they haven't lived it. And and this is where the importance, and, and it's been a big discussion this year around the importance of, of lived experience in this space, lived experience um, from the individual's perspective alongside the experts, um, you know, in, in the gendered violence space, it becomes into itself and becomes really, really important. Um, you know, if we start thinking about how to break this down, it's around trying to sit inside somebody else's position in their shoes. And I think it's something that makes people really uncomfortable. 
you know, we think of disabled people as, you know, and as I said, disabled women as needing of care and, and needing to be looked after. But when we hear stories of, 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 of abuse and violence and neglect, it is deeply, deeply uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I've seen people get physically uncomfortable um, during some of the discussions where um, the content's gone into some more heavier areas. And and that it's, I, I, I guess there's a bit of a dissonance there. You know, to really honestly tackle the issue of gender-based violence in particular for women with disabilities, we have to actually start confronting, why is this making us uncomfortable? We have to really start confronting the reality that this this is happening, this, <laughs> that we are people just like you, um, that anybody can become disabled at any point in time and that this could be anyone's reality. Um, it's easy to disconnect from us and our lives and our experiences and what we need people to do unfortunately is to do it in a safe way is to actually connect with it and to see their own lives and reality um, in relation to you know to violence against us rather than it's just a story over there and that happens to those people but it's not my world but the thing is you know this does happen to everyone um can happen to everybody. It is part of your world. Um, that we're not just a story over here to inspire people to feel better about their lives. We're not just a triumph over adversity, um, neatly packaged up little narrative. Um, it's, it's, it's. Don't look to us to motivate you and inspire you to feel good and empowered. Actually, sit within what makes you uncomfortable about violence against disabled women and, and and really pull that apart and ask yourself why. Connect with it and utilise and harness what makes you uncomfortable to start influencing how you go about um, bringing about change moving forward. So we're turning now to some of the questions that uh, people sent in for, uh, for, for this event. Um, we have one uh, from Lucy Dobson, which is asking, what are the failings of the current popular discourse around family violence, do you think? Uh, oh, there's a, um, it's a, it's a really good question. And there's multiple, multiple ways in which I can tackle this. I think we're getting better at it, but I, you know, honestly, one of the big failings is that um, lack of that intersectional lens, I guess, within the, the mainstream discourse around violence against women and gender-based violence. So, again, I've got to think outside of my world and my bubble um, of feminism and the people that I surround myself with, which is, you know, you know quite intersectional, um, you know, really inclusive. But if I look more broadly to the wider community, to our mainstream television, media, networks, uh, you look to who are the voices, who are the people that we position as um, survivors, who are the ones that we bring in. And it's not the disabled women, it's not the First Nations women, it's not the LGBTI, it's, it's not gender diverse people. It's still very lacking in that diversity, in that sort of broader mainstream um, once we get outside of our own safe community of, 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 of our people. And, you know, that is something that is missing from the discourse because I know for myself when I was living with violence was that I remember sitting there and 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 thinking this is back back before 2014 I think white ribbon had just started up and I remember thinking to myself seeing these able bodied white women and going geez those poor women didn't even do anything to deserve it I'm such a difficult person to live with if I wasn't disabled if I wasn't so hard to look after if I wasn't such a burden then he wouldn't do X, Y, Z and not realising that what I was experiencing was violence because there was no one like me out there. There was nobody that I could relate to in the narrative, in the discourse, in the discussions being sort of put out there more broadly um, within the mainstream. Um, you know, since leaving violence, I've found feminism. I've found my voice in this space. I've found people that I can connect with and I've found diversity. But before that, I was 
I lived, I, I, I joke about it and say I used to live under a rock. I literally did. I didn't know anybody in the disability world. I had no idea who Stella Young was. Um, I didn't know who Sam Connor was. I, I, I had no idea really. I think the only feminist voice I'd heard of was Clementine Fords, and that was from very, very peripherally at that point in time. So unless we are showcasing and highlighting that diversity on the mainstream airway, you know, people like myself and people from diverse backgrounds are not going to see themselves and it's and it's hard to connect your experience with reality unless we start talking about violence and gender-based violence from a diverse lens in every step and point of the way. Well, thank you. Um, let's move on to, to another question, I think. This is quite an interesting one. What have you found to be the best approach uh, when you're trying to challenge attitudes towards gendered violence? The best approach. Is, is, there, <laughs> is there a best approach? Um, it depends on the conversation that I'm in and 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 what it is that we're I, I guess discussing. Um, I think the best for me, my approach is being honest and true to myself, my own experience, and frank and fearless. Um, you know, from my perspective, um, for me. When discussing gender-based violence, it means, you know, having that rant on the drum. It means being assertive. It means not holding back sometimes in the face of somebody pushing back on me. It means um, uh, you know, being outspoken, even though I'm, you know, deep down inside quite literally terrified. Um but that's not necessarily the approach that everybody wants to take. Um, sometimes it's that, you know, bringing people along for the journey, not pushing people to the sideline, um, not pushing people further away um, from the core of our agenda. Not, But we also can't be the centrist, middle-of-the-road middle people and trying to make everyone happy. Um, for me, it's around there are going to be people that are going to be unhappy with what I've got to say. There are going to be people that are not going to agree with it. I cannot please everyone. They're not going to like it. I'm going to get called a feminazi C word um, and all sorts of lovely things. And you know what? That is okay as well. It's, I can't please everyone. And if we're going to be honest and genuine about gender-based violence, that means that people are going to be uncomfortable and upset with that. And, and, and for me, that approach, like, I, I can't think of any other way to um, really instill the importance of gender-based, you know, the, the important role everybody plays in bringing down and, and understanding and reconceptualising gender-based violence, you know, without putting people in uncomfortable positions, without making people angry at us. Um, you know, I'm not going to please the men. I'm not going to please the men's rights movement on this. And that's okay. I'm not here to make them happy. I'm not here to hold their hand. I'm here to say I've had enough. We've all had enough and it is time we started bringing everybody up. It is time where us as women and our allies and gender diverse people are saying enough is enough. We matter. You need to listen. And if you don't like it, bugger off. Unapologetically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't don't hold back, Nicole. Tell us what you really feel here. Um, I mean that that's great. Um, I'd I'd like to have a a little think now about this this kind of um, collection of days that we're in because we have the twenty fifth of November, which is um, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. That's a really optimistic phrase and an optimistic aspiration, but you know it's a it's the right one um, to have. Um, we've got the 3rd of December, the International Day for People with Disability. We've got White Ribbon Day on the 6th of, of December, which arose, you know, in Canada after um, uh, um, the, the murder of a number of women um, some years ago. And, and then we've got the 10th of December uh, with Human Rights Day. And they, they all seem to sort of be building towards this, I know, an idea of um, 
um, a better world, but particularly a better world for women and a better world for women with disability. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to ask very generally, what does the International Day of People with Disability, what does it mean for you? Um, how do you like to mark it if you do? And and how do you see it connecting up with those other, other days of yeah. um, recognition and remembrance? Well, yes, I I have to acknowledge it. There we are in the the sixteen days. The third of December falls right in the middle of those. You know, sort of in 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 the mix of those sixteen days. Um, and since um, you know, sort of coming into this world post um, you know leaving violence and 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 finding my way in this world of activism is that you know the third of December since the beginning of of um, I started on this journey in twenty fifteen has been around making that bridging that connection between gender based violence and violence against women with a disability um getting people to realize that international day of people with a disability falls within those 16 days and we need people to recognize violence against disabled women because it does happen at quite horrific um and shocking numbers uh in this country and 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 you know violence and, and i don't just mean physical violence and financial and it's sexual violence as well and which has been a huge topic of debate this year and a huge topic of conversation um sexual violence and you know that disabled women um experience at that at alarming rates so the third of december to me is a day where I'm pushing the disability envelope into that family violence sector. And then from the other side, I'm in the disability sector pushing the family violence um, envelope into that sector because we can't do this as siloed areas of import, you know, uh, uh, sectors. You know, we need the disability sector um, and, and things like the NDIS and all of that to understand, work with, connect with the family violence sector. And the same, we need the family violence sector to work with, connect with the disability sector, the NDIS. Um, and then also we need the mental health sector to then overlap all of those things. And all three of those areas need to start working together, connecting with each other and actually realising that if we really want to get serious about ending violence against all women, we need to stop looking at these issues as siloed issues and start bringing them to get, you know together. So for me, the third of December is is a huge signal around because it does fall in those sixteen day in the sixteen days, and it is a reminder to me, and it is a signal to the rest of the world of, hey, the third of December, International Day of People with a Disability is within the sixteen days of activism. Let's stop looking at these things as siloed issues and let's start, you know, let's start connecting the dots and start speaking of these things as interconnected, correlated, entwined areas of our lives that we cannot move forward if we do not start recognising and looking at the role all of these areas play in our lives. We are not one dimensional. I'm not just a disabled woman. I am multifaceted. We are all multifaceted. And to end violence against all women, we have to start looking, identifying and connecting all the facets that make up who we are as individuals, societies and communities. Okay, thank you. That's a fantastic uh, way to wrap up our, our conversation. And you're talking about uh, connection, interconnection, making those links, making those 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 bonds with allies and uh, to, to move the agenda forward. So, Nicole, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today and being with us. And to everybody else who's watching today, thank you for being here. Um, we really hope you're able to become involved with, to be engaged with uh, some more activities to, that are in association with the International Day of People with Disability. And not just for that day, but for the for the year ahead. So thank you once again. Thank you.